hello everybody. Today I am attempting what many might consider to be an impossible task. I am going to try and improve the reputation of the Honda Jazz. And why is this such a monumental undertaking you ask? Well, find out in today's episode of JM on Cars. exactly where it is in the world that you live, there are a couple of things that might need explaining, which are what is a Honda Jazz and what is the reputation that accompanies it. First off, the Jazz name itself is actually quite an interesting one because if you were to ask Wikipedia, you'd find it's actually been attached to a number of different Hondas over the years, including in the 1980s a small car badged in its home market as the City, but because Opel owned the rights to that here, they instead called it the Jazz. In the 1990s, it got stuck on the side of a rebadged Isuzu MU. It was even used for a couple of small 50cc motorbikes, a cruiser and a scooter. However, for the vast majority of people, certainly in Britain, you mentioned the Honda Jazz and this is the car they're going to think of, which has been in production from 2001 until the present day, though in other markets it is known as the Honda Fit. Regardless, they are more or less the same car, but with differences in terms of trim and specification from region to region. It sits in the Super Mini class, and so some of its rivals would include the likes of the Renault Clio, the Ford Fiesta, and the VW Polo. And it would appear that the Jazz is a very successful car for Honda, being their most popular model in Europe, accounting for up to 30% of their sales. At a quick glance, the car to me looks like the love child of a Mercedes A-Class and a Civic EP3, with the latter certainly being an inspiration, particularly for these later facelift cars that were designed to appeal to younger people who evidently wanted an EP3 but couldn't afford one. However, for whatever reason, and I really don't know what it is, I'm not sure any young person actually ever bought a Honda Jazz, certainly not in Britain. And that is because here, this car has acquired a reputation of being the transport of choice for the older generation. There's something about the Jazz that means it just appeals to people that have got their bus pass. I mean, I'm half convinced that when you turn 65, someone from the government turns up and just hands you the keys to your Honda Jazz. And for that reason, I think this is probably one of Britain's most hated cars, along with the Nissan Micra, because those also share a reputation for attracting that sort of driver, and there is a bit of a running joke that Nissan Micras have an optional fifth gear, because whenever you encounter one on the public roads where it's 60 mile an hour, they'll be doing 40. And then when you're going past a school with children coming out, they'll be doing 40. The Micra is definitely the car of the mono speeder. And the strange thing is, I can never really remember Honda actively going after the older buyer with the Jazz. They just seem to naturally gravitate towards it. I recall very well, a long, long time ago, in a past life, I was doing a corporate video for a large dealership here called Glyn Hopkin. And for that, we had in a couple of genuine, actual customers to do the whole, we're real customers type bits, and they were. And it started off with, you know, so how did you come to Glyn Hopkin? Well, you know, we came here about 10 years ago. We were looking for a car and we bought a Jazz. Lovely, nice old couple that they were. Of course they did. And then it got better because they said, well, you know, we had that. And a few years later, we decided we wanted a bit of a change. So we got another Jazz. Oh, and some friends of ours, they were looking for a car as well. They bought a Jazz. There's just something about these that brings old people to them. I really don't know what it is. Genuinely, hand on heart, no idea. And although this car's current owner, an 18-year-old car enthusiast called Harvey, is about as far away as you could imagine from your stereotypical jazz owner, it's one and only previous certainly conformed to type. A lovely old lady whose car was sold by her children because it got to the point where every time it came back from the shops, it appeared to have acquired a new dent. 
in the time she had it, she had done just 55,000 miles, but still serviced it religiously. And so it comes with a massive stack of paperwork, loads of stamps in the book, no fewer than 16 of them. And I did have to question Harvey when I saw the sticker in the back that said P and A Wood. If you're not familiar, P&A Wood is an internationally renowned dealer of Rolls-Royce and Bentley. They are considered one of the finest car dealerships in the world. And not exactly the sort of place you'd expect to see a 1500 quid Honda Jazz. But it turns out that her son worked there and they even had some of the work done there. So this has seen hands of some of the finest mechanics in the entire world. In spite of this, and I think because of the fact that it was owned by an old lady, when Harvey got it, it did have a few issues. The EGR valve was playing up, resolved by an Italian tune-up, and all four calipers had also partially seized, which then eventually got fixed. I am also delighted to say that not only is he enjoying driving the car, but he's also taken ownership to heart, and has even begun doing his own oil changes and other servicing stuff as well, which is, um, yeah. Very good to see. I am always delighted to hear of stories of young car enthusiasts because on occasion, if you listen to us old farts, you'd believe they were a breed that no longer exist, but they do. Anyway, here we have one of my favorite little stretches of B Road. And I suppose it's time to find out what the jazz is like when you want to put it through its paces. After all, this is the sport model. So how sporty is it? <clears throat> well, we've got another five minutes before we get up this hill, so I suppose the answer is not very. Though it is the Sport and badged as a 1.4 litre, neither of those things are really particularly accurate. First off, I'm not really sure what exactly about this Sport model makes it sportier than its brethren. It's got a very subtle body kit to it with some sills and things to give it that sort of faux EP3 look. But beyond that, I don't think there's really anything in terms of performance to make it go faster, round a corner any quicker, or anything else. It certainly doesn't have any more power. Just 82 horses. And uh, that engine, though here in Europe it's badged as a 1.4, everywhere else it's badged as what it is, a 1.3. I believe the reason they've done that is to try and differentiate it from the lower model, which here was a 1.2. Tragically, in other markets, including Japan, you could actually have had a 1.5 with VTEC, and with that, you could even have the option of all-wheel drive. Oh, a Caterham. And if today's video has you thinking, hmm, you know what, maybe I should give the Jazz some consideration. Well, before you buy, don't forget to use Car Vertical, the super-powered super search that has just doubled my discount from 10 to 20% with the code JM. In just 60 seconds, a Car Vertical report will give you a whole bunch of very important and handy-to-have information on any potential purchase, including previous accident damage, write-off status, outstanding finance, usage as a taxi, fire, theft, and even basic stuff like MOT failure points. For more information, check out my link in the description and the comment section down below. So power, it does not have. Torque, it does not have. Revs, it does not have. The limit here is 6,000. It at least has a very pleasant five-speed manual gearbox. The alternatives being either a torque converter auto or, in some markets, a CVT. And uh, we don't like CVT, so... Uh, very glad that it's got the manual. The seats actually are pretty decent, and though they're clearly not particularly sporty, actually, they have a little more side support than you would expect, certainly from looking at them, and uh, they do a pretty decent job. The suspension is set up fairly nicely. At the back, the car has just a simple torsion beam affair, much like, unfortunately, the later Civic Type R even, and that means it's maybe a little firmer on occasion than you might expect, but over tarmac like this, it does a decent enough job. The steering is quite slow and in typical Honda fashion doesn't really have all that much feel. I must say there are very, very few Hondas I've ever driven where I'd consider the steering to be a highlight. The Civic Type R, FK8 and the new NSX. I think that's it. Even the old NSX I've driven and every time been very disappointed by the steering. 
if you happen to have one of those and you think what I've just said is absolutely outrageous and you'd like to see it corrected, please do drop me a line. My email address is in the description of every video. It's talk at jm.com. Anyway, back to the jazz. Though it may not be particularly sporty, and in fairness, sport really here is a trim rather than a description, you do at least have plenty of toys. So you've got air conditioning, you've got AM and FM, CD, aux in, three nice, very clear dials that give you, I suppose, all you absolutely need, revs, speed, and fuel, and down here a very basic digital display giving you your outside temperature and your overall mileage. All of the controls are nice, easy to reach, the pedals all very lightly weighted, the brakes are quite heavily servoed, more so than I'd really like, but in this sort of car you kind of expect it. Visibility is absolutely superb and this car does have a few party pieces, of which that I certainly would consider one. Any direction you look in, you can see this is really quite fantastic. You don't have parking sensors anywhere, but honestly, you don't need them. Because the back of the car is effectively flat, your rear window is the rear of the vehicle, and so parking it should be pretty simple. Particularly for a young person, this is a very good car. It's nice and narrow, so on a country lane like this, again, it's fairly easy to place them. Though you can't see all that much of the bonnet, well, none of it really, there also isn't much of it, so again, it shouldn't be a concern. But, inside, this car really is something quite special. Though none of the materials are particularly stand out, it has worn the test of time very well. And though its previous owner, who, let's for the sake of argument, we'll call Beryl, has looked after it very well with no real obvious signs of marks, scuffs, or anything like that, even around the key barrel, it looks fairly nice and very well cared for. You do get the feeling that even if it hadn't been, it would still be in good nick. Oh, turning circle, better than some other Hondas. Yeah, better than some others. The real star of the show for me though, it's the interior space, because this car has to be one of the most cleverly packaged in its class. What Honda did was they fitted it with that torsion beam rear suspension, and then, to make it even better, they moved the fuel tank from the rear, where you'd expect it to be, to here, below me. And though this does give you a slightly elevated driving position, because the whole car is also quite tall, it doesn't really bother me all that much. And you also get the benefit of the car then becoming something of a TARDIS, because even without the rear seats folded down, you have loads of room in this car, not just for its class, but even the class above. It's stupendous. And then you can also fold the seats in one of a variety of different ways, either simply down flat, or you can even pull the bottom section up as well, giving you loads of space in this car. I have driven 4x4s, big ones that have less space than this. It's a common Honda strength, and here really it's maybe better than in just about any other. The car's practicality even recently got put to the test when Harvey had to help his girlfriend move house. And what better way to win a lady's heart than with a nice, sensible, practical car? Oh yes, I'm sure that helped win him some kudos. It also does well in terms of running cost. As you might imagine, this 1.4 litre engine isn't particularly thirsty, and if you do want to indulge in a little bit of hypermiling, as Harvey occasionally does, you'll get over 50 out of it. On a gentle, regular run, you'll get somewhere in the 40s, but even being driven like a teenager would, you still get high 30s. That's very, very good. It means that even though the car has a fuel tank of just 42 litres, it still has a reasonable range. Taxes also not too bad for the incoming year. I believe he said it's about £180. Insurance, likewise, is also surprisingly reasonable. The previous year, he paid just 1,200 quid, and bearing in mind, he was a newly qualified driver. This year, despite the fact he's had no accidents or anything else, his insurance, like everybody else's, has gone up, and now it's more like 14 to £1,500. The car does not have a black box fitted, but he does have an app on his phone that he needs to have enabled all the time, which essentially follows wherever he is. Maybe it's that that's made these so attractive to old people, but honestly, having now sampled it, yeah, sure, the steering is limp and woolly and not so great, and the engine is relatively gutless, but 
if you are a newly qualified driver, well, that's almost certainly going to be the case, whatever it is that you buy. Sure, something like a Clio Renault Sport is going to be more engaging, but as a 17 year old, you're not going to be able to afford one of those. Same goes for a Hot Fiesta and the like. And maybe actually that is something that Honda got wrong. Yeah, sure, we had the Civic Type R, but there was never a Jazz Type R. I wish there was, I think it would have been quite a cool thing. And therefore, there was no variant of the car to convince people that the one they were able to afford was still cool. And for that reason, it was just the likes of Beryl that bought it. And that's a shame because from where I'm sat right here, this is a car that has an awful lot going for it. You can pick these up now from about a thousand pounds with two to three getting you in a really decent, nice, clean and tidy example. Even better, because the vast majority of owners are older people, you're likely gonna find them in this sort of condition with a few scratches, dents and dings on the exterior, but also having relatively low mileage and often having been serviced, usually at the main dealer, somewhat religiously, for the entirety of their lives. Helping to seal the deal, particularly if you're maybe watching this as a parent, thinking of what car to buy your child, this was considered to be one of the safest in its class and achieved four stars in the Euro NCAP rating, doing very well in all the other safety tests it encountered at the time. Of course, by modern standards, it probably wouldn't score quite so highly, but in its class of its day, it was a very good thing. And so I would have absolutely no worries whatsoever about letting my child out in a Honda Jazz. It also, by virtue of being a Honda, is a relatively reliable car with parts availability being fairly good and reasonably cheap, though with the odd bit being shockingly expensive. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the one thing you do really need to keep an eye on and which could be a bit of a deal breaker is rust. Like many a Japanese car, these do suffer from it and particularly if they've lived maybe near the seaside, this is something you'll want to check before you buy. However, there's certainly no horror show, and Harvey and I were discussing how many a Mercedes of the day we know actually to be considerably worse in that department. And so there we have it. That is a look at the Honda Jazz. Certainly that most unpetrol heady of cars and maybe the least cool thing any young person could possibly conceive of owning. But that actually to me is something they should give some thought because you know what? If I were young again, chance would be a fine thing. This actually would do me very well indeed. I always liked estate cars and the like, and this actually has as much space as, well, just about any estate car I've ever owned. It's a little bit smaller, easier to park, good on fuel, and yeah, if you squint a bit, it does look like an EP3 Type R. What more could you want? Anyway, a big thank you to Harvey for bringing this car out and as ever to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.